If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation, the third chapter. I really do believe that this is a word that the Lord wants his church to hear because it's a message that so perfectly aligns with the message Lady K delivered last week. And believe me when I say that she and I had no in-depth discussion about what God was speaking through either of us regarding the words. So I want to invite you to open your heart and hear this today. And although it may sound doom and gloom to the non-believer, to the believer, the message should ignite a sense of hope in you. Amen? Amen. So let's hear it and be thankful that God would be so mindful of us that he would send messages that pull on us to recognize the state, the condition of the world, and where we are as the body of Christ. I do petition your prayers and amens as I stand before you as his mouthpiece because I know in my own power I cannot do it. And I once heard a preacher say that even if you hold back your amens, I got enough in my own pocket <laughs> to push me through the word today. Amen, somebody. So one more time, can we just lift the praise in the room to the God of our salvation? Hallelujah. Let's go to the word as it's found in scripture. The last book in the Bible is where we will begin. The book of Revelation, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. And this book is one that many believers try to stay out of because of the end time revelation that it possesses. But how can we really know what to prepare for, what to put our hope in, if we don't study what's already being told about the end time? It fully describes the Son of Man, who is Jesus, in Revelation 1, 14 through 15. And it gives us a description of heaven as it is in Revelation 4. It tells us about the end time and what to expect. So don't be afraid about what is to come. But because we are believers, like I said, we should have hope. Look at somebody and say, have hope in God. Hallelujah. So just to give you some background before I get into the scripture, our writer is going to be John the Apostle. And by the time John starts to write what we call the book of Revelation, he has been exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the gospel. So he is in this place of exile, no community, no true sense of entertainment as we would know it today, and an easy way of living, so to speak. But it's in the same place of exile, hallelujah, that place that was intended to keep him from preaching, where God met him by way of angel encounters and visions to bear witness to what the Lord is saying. And I'm not preaching on that today, but I just want to know, is there anybody that can give the Lord praise? Because when life tried everything to leave you exiled, when life sent every reason your way to be a castaway, you still found a way to allow the Lord to speak to you and through you. This small insight on John should let us know that when the Lord really calls us to a thing, there is no reason or season of exile that can prevent him from getting through to us. John finds himself exiled yet exemplary. Say amen, somebody. What do you mean exiled yet exemplary? Meaning that when he had every reason to be silent, every reason to say, well, that's a wrap, he remained committed to being a witness to what thus saith the Lord. John proved himself to be a desirable model. If it was some of us on that island, we would find every reason to, write, to not write the letters. Uh-uh, God, I can't write with no pencil. You can't send me no pen. I need double line paper. But I realized even in preparing this that even when we have moments of God, nobody wants to hear from me. He showed me that that could be the problem in one of the churches today is that we think that when we take the podium, that when we pray, that people are hearing us, but it's really them hearing God through us. And that's why there is nothing that he won't do to get through to you. So John proves himself worthy of the call and writes letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor that is now known as Turkey, to the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, 
Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, he writes, when you study the seven churches, you will find that not all of the churches were rebuked, but some churches were praised and rebuked. Some churches were simply praised for the work and their steadfastness. By now, we should all have Revelation 3 open, so let's go to the scripture. Revelation 3 and 1, it reads as this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Somebody say, I have to have a firm grip. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly. Somebody say suddenly. As unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce them before my father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear, he is saying to the churches, the word of the Lord is already blessed. If you notice in the scripture, if you have the paper copy or even in your electric, your digital Bible, we are reading John's writing, but we are hearing Jesus' words as they are in red ink. John writes, but Jesus speaks. I stand, but God proclaims. So Jesus speaks and said to the church, I know all things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Let's pause and examine what Jesus is saying. If you've heard me preach before, you will know that definitions are given to bring further understanding to scripture. So Jesus says, you have a reputation. Reputation is defined as the beliefs or opinions that are held about you. A widespread belief that someone has a certain characteristic. He says, oh, I, I know what the world thinks about you, church in Sardis. They believe you are active, doing the work of he who sent you. And although the world sees you in the light of reputation, I, the Lord, see you in the truth of character. And in that truth, in, in that light, you are a dead people. Say amen, somebody. Character being defined as the mental or moral qualities distinctive to an individual. Your character is the truth of who you really are at the end of the day. Jesus says the world sees you in the light of reputation, but I see you at the core. And what I see, it's, it's, it's without life yielding no true effectiveness. In other words, Jesus repeats what he said in Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people honor me, hallelujah, with their lips, but their hearts, they're far from me. Verse 9 says their worship is, is, is farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. And it's a dangerous thing as a church for us to find ourselves teaching and preaching man-made ideas in place of what is the true faith of God. Many say you only live once. Y'all know we used to say YOLO. You only live once. But this word of God says you live twice. And the life that is to come is more real than the life that is even now. So do all you can to withstand evil in the way thereof. I want to pause and let you know that as I prepared this, I had to change some things about myself over the past few hours, even of the morning, reading over this word and realizing that although I'm proclaiming it to us, it's a self-received word at first. We've fallen subject 
to a compromised gospel. Not only is it dangerous for us to teach and preach false teaching, but for those of us who tell ourselves we don't need the Bible as much as we do crystals and sage. This ideology that we can manifest whatever it is we desire. Paul writes in Galatians 1, 6 through 7, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. The church has had a history that's so sad of those who come into the true gospel of Christ, yet they find themselves at some point swayed by sensational scripts and desires. And today God is saying to his people, as he did in Revelations 3 and 2, wake up. Say amen, somebody. Jesus in Revelation 3 and 2 says, wake up. If I didn't tell you yet or if you didn't see it online, I need to give you the title of the message. And the message is entitled, A Sleeping Church. A Sleeping Church. Last week, the Lord asked a question to us through Lady. As the world turns, where is the church? And I love him so much because he will never ask a thing without already having the answer. And today he answers and sends reinforcement to last week's word. And he sent me on assignment to tell the church that we are sleeping, sleeping, and it's time to wake up. Wake up, O sleeper, saith the Lord. Wake up from your slumber and come alive. Wake up from your carnal satisfactions and come alive. Wake up from your idol worship and say, come alive. Sleep in the natural is defined as a condition of the body and mind that recurs for several hours every night in which the eyes are closed, the postural muscles are relaxed, the activity of the brain altered, and consciousness of the surroundings are practically suspended. Another definition read that it is a periodic state of many living things that is marked by the absence of wakefulness and by the loss of consciousness of one's surrounding. You have no clue what's happening around you. And if we be very direct, your time of slumber is the most vulnerable time because while you sleep, the world continues. I want you to hear this in the spirit that as you sleep, the world you see continues and the world that you cannot see continues. The church is in a vulnerable state, but he lets them know that all is not lost. Say amen, somebody. Jesus says, strengthen what little remains for even what is left is almost dead. In other words, I'm not pleased with the overall condition of who you are. But I see a glimpse of hope. Look at somebody and say, there's hope. Hope for you to recover what remains before that too becomes lifeless and unaware. I feel as if this message comes to strengthen those of us who still have a little life. Is that your testimony that after everything I've been through, church hurt, relational issues, family matters, losing my job, losing my marriage, losing my home, everything that came to try me, I have a testimony that there's still a little bit left. He seeks among the sleeping those who are still aware of the hour, those who still have a holy consciousness of what is happening in the world today. So the question comes in now that we see the issue, how do I rise from this place? Revelation 3 and 3, Jesus encourages the church to go back to what you heard and believed at first. And when you get there, hold to it firmly. So we sit today with a clear echo in the room that it's time to wake up. But there's an underlying question I had to ask myself while preparing. When I had to recognize the areas of my life and spiritual walk that I have been in slumber in, what put the church to sleep? What has rocked us 
into a place of unconsciousness? What was it that put you to sleep from the time you came to life in salvation? What was it from the day you were born again, set on fire for the Lord, excited to tell the world that for God I live and for God I die? What was it that crept up in your system and allowed you to sleep? What was that melatonin, so to speak, that ushered you into a rest? What did you consume that ultimately rocked you to sleep, church? Something has entered our system that was able to shift us into a state of sleep. And I had to sit with myself and be honest, and I didn't like the truth of what I had to confess before God. For some of us fell into a slumber after being drunk with the desires of our flesh. Galatians 5, 19 through 22 gives you a breakdown of those things. Some of us fell into sleep after allowing the voices in our head to convince us that we could never be used, we could never be loved, that we would never overcome, that we'll always be in this place of loneliness and lowness. But today, say today, we silence the noise and we come out of cycles that have consumed us. We silence the voices when the truth of God where he says in his word that you are fearfully and wonderfully made needing you to realize that you are created in the likeness of the Godhead we have fallen asleep and while we lay there has been a thief of the truth on the scene by way of infiltration infiltration being the action of entering access to an organization or place secretively to acquire information or cause harm. Am I helping anybody in the room today? When you look around at the condition of the church, there has been a breach of beliefs and sacred things have become tainted and tossed out. If the church is asleep, then who is reaching the world? If the church has been infiltrated by the influence of carnality, who is reaching who? Is the world reaching us? Or are we reaching the world so that the world might come into the likeness of Christ? While the church sleeps in a bed full of religiosity and pomp and circumstance, so many elevations to the bishopric, and I'm not saying anything against that, but when we look at the grandeur of these ceremonies, and then we look and compare how many souls are being saved, how many people are testifying on the same social media where we see elevations, how many times do we see testimonies of I once was lost, but I encountered somebody who introduced me to a man that knew everything about me. While we sleep in a bed, we are too deep in slumber to recognize that something is having its way under the sheets where we sleep. And that there's something going on that should make us be uncomfortable. We lose our sense of awareness when we sleep, and if we don't wake up, we will run the risk of oversleeping. You know how it is as the weekend ends and we prepare for Monday. You set an alarm for Monday morning. Why? Because you want it to aid you in waking up on time. Because you realize that if you wake up too late, you run the risk of missing important moments that come with morning. I hope you hear this in the spirit that if we stay in our beds of slumber too late, we run the risk of being caught off guard and unprepared for mourning. Mourning to the believer is the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus says it in the tail end of the third verse, repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. who choose to walk and ignore the signs of the time. The church and world at large have grabbed hold to the fact of, well, no man knows the day nor the hour when he's coming, so I have time. I'm going to need your help right through here, musicians. But 
don't get me wrong. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. There are things that have to take place as a sign to his return. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son himself. Only, hallelujah to God, only the father knows. While Jesus declares this truth, he also gives insight of his return in a few parables. In Matthew 24 and 25, he gives direct reference to it being as a thief coming in the night. That although no one but the Father knows the exact time, he does know that it will be any day now. Say amen, somebody. Jesus even compared it to Noah's day. When you read Matthew 24 into the 37th verse, where in the days leading to the flood, the people were busy enjoying banquets and parties right until the time that Noah entered the boat. They did not realize the time until they were swept away. So we have settled for no man knows when. But in Matthew 24, that's where we settle with that. But we miss the importance of 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. When Paul writes on the resurrection of the body, and he says, it will happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet sounds, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. Transformed. Say amen, somebody. We have to wake up because any day now, the church is being raptured away. So we must wake up. Shout, wake up. We've got to wake up in order to be caught up. I'm almost to my closing point, but I want to walk one more passage of scripture found in Matthew 25. And this will give us an illustration of the message at large. Somebody shout, wake up. Turn with me to Matthew 25. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 25 says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. Verse 5, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. Jesus ends this parable by saying, so you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. The Jewish custom was that the bridegroom would arrive at the bride's house to get her accompanied by the bridesmaids. And the bridesmaids' jobs were to light the way into their celebration. And the arrival of said bridegroom was expected, but it was not known. However, there was an understanding that the bride should be ready because at any moment, the announcement of his arrival would be made. Not only did the bride need to be ready, but the bridesmaids had an obligation to be ready. So let's look at an important part of this parable. And I've heard this uh, parable taught and preached, but it always dealt with the oil. 
But Matthew 25 and 5, in the NLT it reads, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. The King James Version says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The thing I have never heard anyone break down is that while the coming was delayed, they got sleepy and fell asleep. Some fell asleep prepared and some fell asleep unprepared. And I love how Jesus foreshadowed events through his teachings because he says, and at midnight, there was a cry made. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. Can you hear the cry today, spirit and truth? Can you feel the urgency to be ready? Can you feel the tug on your heart to stay alert and keep watch? The parable goes on to say that the five prepared could not share what they had. And the five who fell asleep unprepared had to run and grab oil. But by the time they returned, the bridegroom had already come and took those who were prepared into the celebration. The five who had to run and get more oil returned and begged to enter, but they were met with such a sad phrase to hear from the Lord. Believe me, I don't know you. Jesus ends this parable by saying, so you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or the hour of my return. But there is good news today that there are some in the church, glory be to God, who Jesus says have not soiled themselves with evil doings. They will walk with me in white, saith the Lord, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white, and I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. We have to wake up and go back to the foundation of our faith. The old church sang a song, take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back to the place where I first believed. And I don't know if that's your petition in the room. You can rest on your feet. But I don't know if that's an echo in your heart today. That, Lord, I'm willing to go back to the beginning of it all. That somewhere along the way I, I strayed, somewhere along the way I've compromised myself. compromised myself and to be honest today I realized that I'm sleeping doing church but I'm sleeping being a light to those in darkness but I sleep Ephesians 5 and 14 says for the light makes everything visible this is why it said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. 
Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as you stand, I want you to take a moment and just self-reflect on where you are. Reflect on when you first fell in love with Jesus. The time in your life when conviction was easy to feel. We're going to do an altar call, but I don't want it to be one like normal. I want this altar call to change something in you when you come. Not coming to have a emotional high. But when you come, come with a heart that's yielded to the Lord. If you've heard this word and you can recognize where you are in this word and how God really is sending us a cry to wake up and come to life. You can make your way to this altar. And I see this altar call as a way of stretching. You know, when you've had a good night's sleep and the first thing you do when you stand up is you just stretch and you just rub sleep out your eye. That's what this altar call should be for us today. I heard someone say that the first thing they say in the morning is, good morning, Holy Spirit. What would you like to do today? So this altar represents a new morning for us. This altar represents a place of repentance and turning. And as you begin to pray, just invite the Holy Spirit to minister to you.